Hello, everybody. Welcome to this special episode of The Tom Woods Show that will consist of a discussion between two eminent scholars, Dr. Martin Koldorf and Dr. Eric Topol. They will be discussing the optimal public health approach to the challenge posed by COVID-19. We're going to do something a little bit different in this discussion. Each participant will have an opportunity for an opening statement, laying out his position, and then each will respond to the other's statement. And after that, I will disappear into the background entirely and allow these two gentlemen to ask questions of each other and continue the discussion. Once the conversation appears to have run its natural course or a certain amount of time has passed, I will reemerge and give each person the opportunity for a final word. I want to be as impartial as possible, so the biographical information I will read was supplied by the participants themselves. Dr. Martin Koldorf is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. His research centers on developing new epidemiological and statistical methods for the early detection and monitoring of infectious disease outbreaks and for post-market drug and vaccine safety surveillance. Dr. Eric Topol is a professor of molecular medicine at Scripps Research, founder and director of its Translational Research Institute, a practicing physician, and one of the top 10 cited medical researchers. So, Let's turn now to our opening statements. Dr. Topol, because I've taken pretty strong public stances in support of Professor Koldorf, as a gesture of goodwill, I would like to give you the opportunity to decide whether you would prefer to go first or second. I'm happy to go first. That'd okay. be fine. And, and you, each of you, and I forgot to mention, instead of debating one resolution, um, instead what we've done is each participant has developed his own resolution, in effect, uh, his a, a statement of his particular position that he will then proceed to defend. And I have those that I can either read or, or the participants can read. If you could read mine, that would be great, Tom. Professor Topol's position is, everyone needs to be protected from COVID-19 infections and can be without the use of lockdowns. All right, Professor Topol. Thank you, Tom. And uh, thanks, Martin, for having a chance to discuss this important topic with you. Uh, I know I, I was uh, joshing with Tom yesterday in a note that I feel like I'm coming into the lion's den because I know the listeners of his podcast are lean uh, very much uh, away from the view that uh, we need to protect everyone and are very much in favor of the focus protection uh, uh, and the great Barrington declaration that you, uh, Martin, and colleagues uh, put together back in October and published. Um, I think there are some issues, though, that need to be grappled with. Um, the first I'd like to get into is that I think the views of the Barrington uh, Declaration are very much death-centric. That is, their focused protection, uh, trying to have the elderly or those who are most prone to dying uh, be put in a separate compartment and protected. But the problem is, is that the young people, and here we're talking about people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, who get mild COVID, some even asymptomatic, at worst moderate, are the worst uh, risk for long COVID. There are many papers published on this. At least 10 to 20% of people who get COVID infections uh, have long-term sequelae. And in fact, uh, recent papers suggest that goes on well into seven or eight months is debilitating, at least half don't get back to work uh, and or return to their normal baseline activities before they got an infection. So the idea of focused protection for the uh, people at risk, high risk, particularly the aged, doesn't take into account the morbidities uh, of long COVID. Moreover, the 41-year-old um, who died yesterday, the Republican Congressman uh, Luke Letlow, uh, who had just been elected, is an example of people who die uh, young. And the point is, because this is such a disseminated infection throughout the world, and particularly in the United States, we have young people dying. And because it's so, the denominator is so big, even though it may be a very small fraction, it adds up to a lot of numbers of people. And, and in addition to that, uh, you know, we have on the front page today of the New York Times, a 51-year-old man who was previously healthy, who's been hospitalized seven times, and a review of uh, a re readmissions to the hospital without dying, uh, whereby it's 10 to 20% in multiple series. 
So the morbidity is missed by this great Barrington Declaration of Focus Protection. I hope I can get that point across. The second issue is about herd immunity, natural herd immunity. Today, uh, Vox, the website, uh, puts it out as the worst idea of 2020. Uh, natural herd immunity has never been established, never been established. That is, it's relied, all infections of viruses have required uh, a vaccine. So to think that COVID would be the first one to establish natural herd immunity uh, is just not based on data. And the, the country that's most simulated the plan of the Barrington, the Great Barrington Declaration was Sweden. And Sweden has done extremely poorly. And in fact, uh, the idea of focus protection there uh, has resulted in uh, the largest numbers of deaths in, of Sweden in 150 years. Uh, and now very close to the U.S. in terms of the U.S. now is one per 970 people who have died. And in Sweden, it's one in 1140. These are very bad outlier statistics. Only a few countries in the world are worse than that. Now, the one area that we published on that I think is pertinent here are the asymptomatics. We have published in the Annals of Internal Medicine 16 cohorts, and we have another paper coming out with much larger numbers where we try to call all the data on asymptomatics together. And we find that 30 to 40% of people who get COVID never knew, never had symptoms. It was not discernible that they had COVID. Now, this is really important because if you're trying to uh, develop a focused protection program and you have so many people, such a large proportion of 30 to 40% who don't ever even know they have an infection, which is in part why we have more than 60 million Americans by seropositive studies to project that over 60 million Americans have had COVID now. So this is a big issue because four series of people who had CAT scans of their lungs who were asymptomatic, half of them had the classic uh, ground glass opacifications, consolidations of COVID. That is, it was internally hurting them, but they didn't know it. So they're asymptomatic at multiple levels, not just without symptoms, but with internal damage. And in fact, I've written about the heart sequela of COVID in science. And indeed, the same thing has occurred. There's been young people even sudden death in athletes, professional athletes, and young people, college athletes with myocarditis, they were asymptomatic. And in fact, a series in Germany of 100 people who underwent magnetic residence imaging, 18 were asymptomatic, and 12 of those people had significant uh, abnormalities in their heart magnetic residence imaging, consistent with myocarditis or damage. So there's a big part of asymptomatic that, again, is not captured if you only focus on death. Now, as far as lockdowns, uh, the L word, this evokes a lot of emotion because none of us want to have a lockdown. And I actually think uh, they would be horrible. We have to resort to any lockdowns. Uh, and in fact, I don't believe we've ever had a real lockdown in the United States because if you look at other countries in the world where lockdowns have been uh, used, they've been enforced, they've been severe. And if people left their home, uh, they would be uh, you know, either fined or even arrested in certain countries. So we have had lockdown lights in this country. Currently, there's only three states that have a stay-at-home. Uh, uh, California, which is in really bad shape right now, where I live in Southern California, uh, where, it, it, for example, in Los Angeles, hospitals are running out of oxygen. They have uh, putting uh, patients in the gift shop and in conference rooms. Uh, and that's during a uh, stay-at-home order because the mobility hasn't changed from the pre-stay-at-home. That is, it's not being observed. It's not being adhered to. And the other two states uh, that are using uh, uh, are North Carolina and, uh, and uh, Ohio. So there's hardly any of these lockdown lights, if you will, going on in the U.S. And we don't want them. Uh, you don't want them. I certainly don't want them. But there are other ways to do this. And a focused approach, since focus is a word that's used uh, in the Great Barrington uh, uh, Declaration. That is cluster busting, as was used in Japan. That is, um, these events that we know are likely to be super spreaders. And this Pareto principle of 80% of infections occur 
from 20% of the people through these super spreader venues. And so there you have uh, the idea of these gatherings like weddings uh, and, and uh, religious gatherings that are known and implicated for spread that need to be, uh, be on, the, on the vigilant about and trying to prevent crowds and certainly improving ventilation and other things that can avoid these super spreader events like the occurred with the Biogen conference. Now, the point about biding time is, is important, that is protecting everyone and biding time, because we have seen during the 2020 year throughout the pandemic that the mortality reduction has been uh, important. That is by means of using proning, uh, avoiding mechanical ventilators, using blood thinners in the right people, uh, and using dexamethasone when there's uh, early evidence of cytokine storm. There are many things that we can do to lower the mortality. Beyond that, we now have things like monoclonal uh, antibodies to the virus that when used early can completely inactivate it, uh, particularly in people who don't have any of their own intrinsic antibody response. And um, we can have uh, the ability to see further mortality decrease uh, it, as we employ newer therapies and hopefully roll out the vaccines uh, in a high proportion of people. So what I'm proposing, uh, in fact, is avoidance, total avoidance of lockdowns, even light lockdowns, but being very um, much uh, an aggressive approach that has not been undertaken in the United States. Firstly, uh, I note the omission of masks in the Great Barrington Declaration, and I certainly think that masks are a vital part. This is a respiratory virus. That's how it's transmitted through droplets and aerosols. And so masks uh, are essential and the highest quality of masks, the better. And that's why I believe the government uh, should distribute masks as was originally planned in April by the US Postal Service. 650 ma million masks were going to be sent. And that was, a, that was uh, shot down by the Trump administration. But sending out high quality masks to every household. Every household should have rapid home tests to be able to determine if they have high viral load and are infectious. They've been ready since April, and they should be in every household, a large supply of these antigen tests that are very uh, quick, within 15 minutes, some get down to less than five minutes, and they can establish if someone should stay home, it should be isolated because they are potentially infectious. Moreover, we should be doing wastewater surveillance. We should have every individual through their phone or whatever access they have to the, to the internet to be able to determine what risk level they are at uh, by wastewater surveillance, by digital sensors, picking up things like heart rate that we published on, which is when it's elevated at rest in a cluster of people, it denotes uh, the emergence of an early outbreak and can be thwarted and is being used, for example, in Germany uh, throughout 600,000 people in the country to monitor uh, COVID. So there are many things that we could do that we aren't doing, unfortunately. And lastly, I just want to say I do fully agree uh, with your proposal. I believe you are in agreement with uh, your colleague, uh, uh, Jay uh, um, Karia, which is res with respect to who should be vaccinated. And there I do agree that we indeed need to vaccinate the, the aged, like you, I think, uh, have proposed with Jay. Uh, the uh, Wall Street Journal uh, uh, op-ed that was published talked about ending lockdowns next month. I think that's way too optimistic. We now have a variant, the B117 uh, variant of the virus, which is very concerning because it increases transmission. All the things that we're discussing now are becoming more challenging to avoid spread. So I don't believe that schools should be shut down, but I do understand that this is a multi-generation exposure when kids come home, kids exposed to teachers and uh, universities, colleges have used frequent testing, as has Slovakia, as has Liverpool, to test asymptomatics and block spread. And now, now that we have in Colorado this variant appearing, it's going to, within the matter of weeks and the months ahead, become the dominant strain 
virus in this country, just as it has already uh, been occurring in the UK. So we, our challenges are going to be formidable because we're not rolling out the vaccines as was projected. The operation warp speed of the doses that were uh, forecast are way off the mark. Uh, and so there is no chance that things are going to get better just in the next month, really. We have to be realistic about this. And we're looking at several months minimum from now. And we're looking at a much more challenging uh, virus to be confronted. So that's a summary. I think there are some points of agreement, uh, Martin. But I think there are some issues here that hopefully I've covered, at least in this opening remarks. Uh, I look forward to your comments. All right. Thank you, Dr. Topol. Dr. Koldorf's resolution is uh, instead of the current lockdowns, we must better protect the old while letting the young live normal lives. So, Professor Koldorf. Uh, thank you so much, Tom. And thank you, Eric, uh, for participating in this and for your, uh, for your thoughtful uh, comments to start off. So, uh, if we look at uh, this pandemic and what's happened during the last, uh, uh, during uh, this, this year. Uh, our approach to this pandemic is the worst assault on the working class uh, in half a century since uh, segregation and since the Vietnam War. So what we essentially, is, what we essentially are doing, we are protecting uh, 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 young professionals who can work from home, uh, people like lawyers, uh, academic scientists, journalists, uh, while we are exposing older people at high risk um, that are in the working class, uh, people who work as janitors, cab drivers, uh, in supermarkets, in food processing plants, etc. So uh, uh, we have uh, we have really put the burden on this pandemic on those less affluent. And we can see that from graphs, for example, from Toronto. Uh, before there was a lockdown in Toronto, uh, there was about equal number of cases in uh, all neighborhoods, uh, affluent and less affluent. But then uh, after the lockdown, you could see that uh, the, the cases in the affluent neighborhoods patterned out, but it went, continued to spike in the working class, less affluent uh, neighborhoods. So, we have sort of shifted uh, a burden of this disease onto the uh, less affluent working class people, while uh, those of us who can work from home has been protected. So uh, yeah, in the same way as it's possible to shift the risk uh, in that way, what we should have done instead and what we should still do is to shift the risk of infection from those that are um, less, uh, uh, from those that are more to reduce the risk for those that are at most at risk from mortality. So while anybody can get infected of COVID, there is more than a thousand fold difference in mortality. And uh, there's also a big difference in, uh, in serious, uh, uh, complications from the disease. But, uh, if you look at mortality, there's more than a thousand fold difference. So that older people, for older people, this is a very serious disease, so much worse than annual influenza. On the other hand, for children, this is not a serious disease and it's less dangerous than the annual influenza for children. So there's that enormous difference. So um, uh, in order to minimize overall mortality, we have to do a better job protecting old people. Um, and, uh, and that's half of the Greg Barrington Declaration. And we have utterly failed doing that during this pandemic, uh, both in the United States and most other countries. Uh, and there are actually very simple public health measures that can be done to protect uh, older, vulnerable, high-risk people that has not been implemented. So half the Great Barrington Declaration is that we need to do a much better job protecting older elderly people. And uh, for example, uh, uh, most mortality is in nursing homes uh, because the people are old and they're frail. So it should be obvious that we should do testing of staff in nursing homes at a frequent, uh, uh, in a frequent way, um, at least three times a week, but maybe every day. And that can be done with these antigen tests, for example. Um, we should have less, uh, and in some, in some nursing homes that's being done, and that's good, but in other nursing homes it's not being done, and to me that's a scandal. Uh, the, other thing, we have to have less uh, staff rotation because uh, the more staff that a resident is exposed to, the more higher the risk is. 
So we should not allow staff rotation between nursing homes so that each staff person that only work in one nursing home, not multiple work in nursing homes. Also within nursing homes, we should try to focus it so that each resident is exposed to as few staff as possible. Um, uh, also, when somebody is uh, testing positive in the nursing home, uh, we have to isolate them and, re and remove them to a different place so that they do not infect others. So there are multiple ways. Uh, of course, there also has to be in the nursing homes things like uh, 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 general ha uh, hand hygiene and, and masks and those, those kind of things. Um, but there are many things that we could do to protect nursing home residents better, which we're not doing. Uh, another group of people are older people. And of course, the other thing is, since these are the highest risk in nursing homes, those should be at the highest priority for vaccination. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, both, uh, both the residents as well as at the staff. And they are, they are not currently uh, at, the, at the top of the list, which I think they should be. And another, uh, another group of people are uh, old people who work at home. Uh, live at home, um, um, and they, sh they should have help with uh, grocery shopping, for example. There's no reason why they should be in a in a in a supermarket. And I see old people in the supermarket when I go there, and we should have arrangements so that they can be have uh, food delivered. Um, another example are people who uh, older people in the 60s or 70s who are still in the workforce. They need to be better protected. So if they can work from home, that's great. And they're already protected. But those who cannot work from home, because you can't work from home if you're a cab driver, for example, uh, they should be allowed to have a three to six month sabbatical during the height of the pandemic when the transmission is the highest to protect them. And that could be done through different ways, uh, social security, disability insurance, uh, unemployment insurance, et cetera. It doesn't really matter from a public health perspective which, which of those methods are used, but there are ways that we can uh, protect them uh, who are high risk and still in workforce. Uh, the fourth group are the uh, uh, people living in multi-generational homes. And they're actually the lockdowns that make things worse because when we close the universities, uh, many students were sent home. And where do they live? Well, if you're in your, if you're in your twenties, uh, then your parents might be in the sixties or even older, or there might be other older relatives there. So you're actually increasing the, you're increasing the multi generational homes by closing universities. So that was a huge mistake. It's better that if, if a student gets infected, it's better to get infected at university versus, uh, uh, at home. Um, so that was a big mistake. Also, uh, if you live in a multi-generational homes, you're not, there's studies from Sweden that shows that you're not really in increased risk uh, because of children in the multi-generational home, you're increased risk because of working age adults. Um, and I think in Sweden it was about a 70% or 60% uh, increased risk in, in the study in Stockholm if you live with working, working age adults versus uh, 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 older adults. So they are, uh, they are either, they, will also have to work from home and then that's fine. If not, then maybe those older people could live with an older relative or neighbor or friend for a while, or we could make uh, empty hotel rooms available uh, for these to protect them. So there are many ways that we can protect the older people that we haven't utilized. At the same time, this idea of trying to suppress the disease by, by, um, uh, doing lockdowns uh, or closing uh, schools, uh, universities, closing uh, restaurants, closing business and, and those things that has utterly failed to protect the elderly. They have still gotten sick and they have still got uh, died. So this general uh, attempt to sort of uh, suppress the disease by protecting everybody has not worked uh, to protect the old people. So that has been an utter failure of this uh, lockdown strategy that has been implemented around the world, and uh, 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 and we fail to do that, and we fail to implement just basic public health uh, measures that we should have done a long, long time ago. And we still should do that. Of course, at this point, the vaccines are the most important way to do focus protection of the elderly, but we still have to continue. We still have to 
uh, implement these other ones also because uh, vaccines are great, but they are not 100% uh, protection. So uh, vaccines are not enough. You have to do this other protection of the elderly as well. Um, so that's sort of half part of the Great Barrington Declaration that we should and could and can uh, protect all the people better. Uh, the other aspect is for younger people, for children and young adults, uh, uh, they have small risk from uh, COVID-19, but they actually have very high risk from the collateral damage caused by uh, the lockdown. Uh, if we take children, for example, uh, they have almost no risk from COVID, but not getting education uh, is, is a serious negative consequence. Um, and not just for the education, but also for for um, their physical health and their mental health is deteriorating because of that. Um, and their social development. So this is very serious and we are putting a lot of burden on children. I think it's a society and that should never happen. We should never put the burden of, of things uh, uh, on children, they are our future. Uh, and of course, it's uh, especially damaging to working class children because uh, affluent uh, families, they can afford to send their children to private schools, many of whom are open actually, uh, or to have tutors or to um, uh, to do post-schooling or to do homeschooling uh, more, more efficiently. So, uh, uh, the children has really been uh, hurt by these lockdowns. And I think if there's, if there's one thing that I would do immediately uh, to change this uh, in accordance to the Great Declaration, if I could only pick one thing, it would be to open all the schools immediately for in-person teaching. There's absolutely no public health reason to keep them closed. Uh, but also for young, ad uh, young adults, the damaging from uh, the collateral damage from the lockdowns has been severe. Uh, we know that uh, the number of medical visits has plummeted. It, it went greatly down in the spring. It has rebounded a little bit, uh, but not fully. We are still way below uh, the, the, the normal levels of uh, healthcare visits. And when people to go to the doctor, they don't go there for the fun of it. They go there because they need some kind of uh, treatment or prevention or something that will make them... Uh, uh, feel better and live longer. So, uh, for example, the, the childhood vaccination rates have plummeted. Uh, and we have seen in some parts of the world that measles have, uh, have, have, uh, have had outbreaks. Uh, cardiovascular disease outcomes are, are much worse than, uh, than before. Uh, people don't they go to the hospital or to the doctor when they should. They don't get the preventive treatment they should. We have less cancer this year than most year, uh, but that's not because there are less cancer, it's because they're not diagnosed. Uh, and if they're not diagnosed, we can't treat them, and then we'll have worse outcomes. So maybe somebody who didn't get their uh, pap smear screening uh, may now die three or four years from now instead of living another 15, 20 years. So these are collateral damages on, on health. And of course, uh, mental health uh, has deteriorated. Uh, uh, young adults in the 20s, uh, um, uh, many, many had, 25% uh, in June only had uh, suicidal ideation. And that's just in one month, and it's usually in the single digit for the whole year. Uh, and uh, uh, opioid uh, death uh, have uh, increased, uh, increased greatly in March, and April, and May uh, uh, in the 25 to 44 year old age group. So uh, these are these are severe consequences on other aspects of health. And one of the principles of public health is you cannot look only at one disease. You cannot only look at COVID-19 in this case. You have to look at all aspects of health. And this collateral damage is is uh, severe. We are starting to get numbers on it. Um, we, have, we are bombarded with numbers from COVID-19 on a daily basis. Um, but we are starting to get numbers also from these collateral damage from other diseases. But most of, but, uh, and some of them are, are visible in 2020, but there are also many like cancers. We, we don't really see this year, but we will see it in the years to come. So, uh, uh, therefore it's important that young people can live normal lives so that, uh, 
uh, we don't get all this collateral damage. There's also other aspects like uh, uh, eviction, house evictions. Uh, in a way, that's an economic consequence, but that also has significant public health consequences. If somebody can't live, uh, if they become homeless, that has enormous uh, public health consequences. As scientists, we have to look at the whole world also. We can't just look at the United States. And uh, in many of the developing countries, the lockdowns has caused the starvation and uh, uh, malnutrition. And if children are malnutrition uh, as child, that has long-term health consequences throughout their, their life. And one estimate was that there were 10,000 uh, uh, childhood, extra childhood deaths and starvation every month. Uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so those are very uh, tragic and very sad consequences of the lockdowns uh, that, uh, that we have seen. And uh, uh, therefore, I think uh, we have to do a better job uh, protecting the old through vaccinations as well as through other ways. At the same time, we need to let uh, children uh, go to school, students go to universities in person teaching. I would like to let young people resume normal life and uh, uh, all the benefit of the past that in terms of their public health and their mental and physical health. Okay, thank you, Professor Goldwerf. I'm, I'm going to disappear into the background, let the two of you discuss things without my involvement. Oh, are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, sure. And, and of course, I'm as I said, I'm not going to try to direct the discussion, although I would love to hear Dr. Koldorf address the morbidity issue that Dr. Topol brought up, but that's up to you gentlemen to decide. Um, Dr. Topol, um, the floor is yours. Thanks, Tom and, and Martin for your points. Um, let me try to respond a few of them and maybe we can get some back and forth here. Um, you know, I think I can't underscore enough that, um, that even though there is less danger as we go down in age, there still is danger, uh, and it's not just of dying, but even with dying, with 2 million children now having been infected with confirmed PCR testing, there's still infants, children who have died. There's hundreds of children in the United States who have had the multi-system inflammatory syndrome who have nearly died. But also there's the hospitalizations right now. If you look at who's in the hospital in the United States, 40% of the, of the hospitalizations are in people younger than 65. And it's a, lo it's a lot of morbidity. And so, you know, again, it's this it's issue about not just death, but less than death, serious morbidity. Uh, and those who are not in the hospital, of course, not being able to get back to work, who knows how many years that's going to take. Now, while we're on that subject of not knowing the future, um, you know, we should all agree, this has been a very hard year for everyone on the planet. Right. This has not been even the countries that have prevailed, like New Zealand, Australia, Thailand, Taiwan, Vietnam, Japan. You know, there's a long list. They have, uh, Uruguay. Uh, you know, many countries have done very well in this throughout this pandemic. But I've talked to colleagues in some of these countries, and it's not easy. But obviously, there's been a strain on all mental health. But just to be clear, the review of suicides. And the British Medical Journal showed no increase in suicide throughout the pandemic. And while you alluded to suicide ideation in one uh, particular study, there's many studies that negate that it never resulted in people killing themselves during the pandemic. And that, in fact, is surprising, not just from the lockdown, but the loss of our vibrant, normal pre-pandemic life. So, you know, the idea of the schools you and I both agree that we should have all the schools, all the universities open. And the problem with that is it's unguided. If we had the tests, if we had the rapid home tests, each morning, each child would have a test to know whether they should go to school. Each teacher, bus driver, all the staff would each know it's good to go to school today because they test every day, like you were alluding to, and I agree, in nursing homes should be done every day. We have the means. We should have had these tests widely available back in April when they became uh, validated. So the other thing you touched on about the danger, I couldn't agree more about supporting the elderly. And for example, 40% of the deaths in this country have been in nursing homes. 
which is just deplorable that that's occurred. But the idea that we can protect the elderly, which, you know, we failed, and have people do the food delivery, the, the gig jobs like Instacart and working for grocery stores. Well, when the spread begets spread in the community because of all the asymptomatic infections, that's another way we can not protect the people that are bringing in deliveries of food and other things to the elderly. They could easily be infected. No less, you know, the networks involved with um, schools and, and other um, entities. The business issue of closing down businesses that are known to be associated with spread in zones where there's very high community spread, like restaurants, like bars, like gyms. These are focused approaches when things get tough, when, when things are escalating. What I wanted to ask you uh, is when you go to the grocery store, like you mentioned, Martin, do you wear a mask? Uh, yes, I do. Okay. And uh, uh, I wanted to respond a little bit to uh, what Tom said about long COVID. So as with any infectious disease, uh, there are people who have long-term consequences of COVID-19. Uh, that's also true, for example, from influenza. There are some people who, most people recover quickly, but there are some people who have long-term consequences of, uh, of influenza. Uh, now, I have not seen any study that shows that the long-term consequences from COVID is worse than the long-term consequences from influenza. I have heard uh, anecdotal reports from uh, from physician friends that is about the same, but those are just anecdotal reports, and I have not seen any thorough study to determine that the long-term consequences of COVID is worse than from influenza. Now, obviously, we do not know anything about what the long-term consequences are beyond uh, I guess uh, around nine months by now, because uh, there are very few people who had, uh, who were, were diagnosed by, uh, I guess it's about 10 or 11 months now. Uh, very few people have been diagnosed for more than a year. So, uh, 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 so I think, uh, uh, we don't know what the long, the beyond the year consequences are from COVID. On the other hand, we do know the long-term consequences from lockdowns in terms of uh, on cancer and mental health and, and those things that are also very severe. Uh, I'm very appreciative of two things that Eric is saying. One is that we should have and should do a better job protecting the elderly because that's half of the Great Barrington Declaration. And it has sort of been very frustrating or disturbing to me that uh, people will criticize the Great Barrington Declaration without uh, acknowledging that we do have to do a much better job protecting the old through standard uh, 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 measures. And people saying it can't be done. We know that it can be done. We can do better testing. And uh, what Eric says is, is correct. We should have this rapid home test, or in this case, nursing home test with antigen that they can, that the staff can take uh, uh, every morning when they come to uh, work and they will know the results in 15 minutes. That should be done there on a, on a frequent basis. Uh, I also agree with Eric that these uh, uh, home tests should be available to everybody uh, over the counter because uh, if, I, uh, if I'm at home and maybe I want to visit an older relative, uh, I want people to have be able to take those tests before they do that uh, so that they can uh, because it's important for all people to have visits by friends and family otherwise they will just sort of uh, die from uh, from loneliness or deteriorate their health from loneliness so it's important and, and also it's important that nursing home uh, residents has visitors from uh, from family and friends so they can check up on them how they're right. doing right uh, uh, is there some medical problem that needs attention uh, that's one of the, 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 I mean, the purpose of having family and friends visiting is obviously uh, social and and uh, and so on. But it's also to check up on the on the on the how they're doing medically and maybe point out if there are problems. So it's very important to be for all the people to have visits and having this rapid home test that somebody can take in the morning. Uh, that is uh, that would be a huge huge help for that. 
And uh, if somebody is positive, well, to, when they're going to visit their, their grandparent, well, maybe uh, they have to wait a few weeks and the uh, cousin have to visit instead that week. So mm -hmm. uh, people can do this type of uh, arrangement. Uh, so that's also an area of agreement that Eric and I, uh, that we have. Uh, I'm also very uh, encouraged about the schools, that Eric wants schools open, as I said. And... Uh, uh, if you look, for example, at, at Sweden, uh, so if you do want to look at sc schools from a, uh, from a scientific point of view, and I expect that Eric agrees with this, we have to look at the place where schools were open during the height of the pandemic, which was in Sweden um, during the spring, where school and daycare were open for everybody ages 1 to 15. And among the 1.8 ch million children uh, in uh, uh, in Sweden, there were exactly zero deaths from COVID uh, during this time period. That doesn't mean that children do not die sometimes from COVID because they do. Yes, that children die from the annual influenza, uh, and it's very tragic every child who dies. Uh, but the children are at lower risk uh, from COVID-19 than they are from influenza. And in Sweden, of the 1.8 million children, there were some hospitalizations. And some severe cases, but the number of hospitalizations were uh, were very small. I think about a dozen or so. Uh, so uh, I'm really glad that uh, we agree that the, the schools and the universities should be open for in-person teaching. Um, and then I think uh, the, the the disagreements are actually probably less than than fifty percent uh, <laughs> because you seem to agree. Uh, half of it, which is protecting the old elderly, and that's very encouraging, and schools should be open. And then we can uh, sort of have a discussion about uh, some of the other... Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, we... Measures. Yeah, I think we both agree that lockdowns need to be avoided. Uh, so I don't, I don't support them. I know you don't. But what we don't agree on, I think, is um, from the lockdowns uh, that you've alluded to in some of your writings, that they've led to higher mortality. We don't know that. Um, that's a long, you know, the long term, we don't know because just like we don't know about how long does long COVID go on, um, the effect of lack of vaccinations in children or cancer screening in adults or cardiovascular screening, we don't know. We have to look at that data at a subsequent time to know if collateral damage did lead to higher deaths because a lot of your approach in this great Barrington is, as I said, death centric. So I think we should acknowledge that we don't have good evidence of that lockdowns, not that I support them, but a lot of the reason why, you know, in the end of lockdowns, again, lockdowns because of uh, the libertarian uh, views, any idea of having to wear a mask or having to have a lockdown, it isn't viewed favorably and it feeds into that. But we don't know that it, it truly increases uh, the death rate. But moreover, the idea that flu generates long flu, it, there's no data to support that. Uh, there are many series, one just published this week of 4,000 people, where the, uh, and also of, of physicians who've had COVID, a, a series that show that this is debilitating in many people. And as I've already mentioned, some uh, people have serious heart involvement, and even without symptoms, half of the people who were screened with CT scans had significant lung abnormalities, which haven't yet cleared up, resolved, so we don't know the length. So this isn't at all like flu, and to try to suggest that COVID's like flu is, is really, you know, I think where we have a significant disagreement. But one thing we do agree on, I think is actually very important and creative that I think we should just develop here. In the, I, I, in the uh, op-ed, and I, I suspect you are supportive of this as well, because we've had so many people who've had COVID infections, that we could get to a level of population immunity with vaccines faster. And the idea is that people who have an infection, have had an infection, wouldn't be in first in line to get the vaccine. The problem we have here, and I totally support that, and it isn't, by the way, a strategy, just like in the US, as you pointed out, it should be older people get vaccinated first. And that's not the way it's proceeding. That's the way it's moving in Israel very rapidly. 
A fourth of the people over 65 have already been vaccinated in Israel in a matter of simply days, really. We should be doing that here. But the problem we have is this prior infection diagnosis because the serology may be negative after a matter of weeks or months. And the problem is what we really need is a neutralization antibody rapid test and say, if you're positive, if you have had a clear cut infection and you have good uh, response, immune response, then you don't need a vaccine right now. They need to be prioritized to the people uh, where the supply is, is vital. And we could get to population level immunity much faster because we have this very large group of, of at least 60 million projected, you know, one fifth of the American population that have been infected. So we agree about that. We just don't have the means to distinguish those who have had natural immunity. And one other point about that, the uncertainty of not being able to diagnose them. In the, in the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine trial, there were 3% who had had prior infections when they checked their serum status after enrollment. And in the Moderna trial, 2.2% had COVID uh, serology positive to the, to the antigen, the SARS-CoV-2 spike antigen. Now, the problem there is that the people in the placebo group in Pfizer trial went on and had reinfections, which was protected by the vaccine almost completely. So the point here is that natural immunity is not as good as, in many people, the vaccine-induced immunity. And my colleague here at Scripps, um, uh, Dennis Burton, who chairs our immunology department, and I wrote about this superhuman immunity that has only been seen in one other virus, uh, HPV, and now it appears to be the case with the mRNA vaccines with its 95% efficacy and protection from reinfection. So just to point, point out here, Martin, we are in agreement that we could capitalize on the unfortunate spread of COVID throughout this country and in other places where it has spread broadly. But we don't have a good way of finding these people with a rapid test yet. Uh, and we also know that there's a gap between their natural immune response and what would be typically induced by the mRNA vaccine. So I, I, I wish we could go there, but I don't think we have a good solution at this point. I wonder what you think. Uh, so I think you're right that uh, people who we know had uh, uh, COVID naturally, a natural infection, they should not be on the top priority for the vaccine. Uh, and uh, we know some of them because uh, of, uh, of antigen tests, some because of PCR tests and some uh, of antibody tests. Uh, and of course, there are some people we don't know if they had it or not, and then we have to assume that they didn't have it. But those we know had it, they should not be prioritized for the vaccine. Uh, I think that uh, uh, we don't have any data of it, of course, but uh, uh, I, I doubt that uh, a vaccine will give as good immunity as natural infection. That would be very unusual. Uh, so uh, my guess is that the vaccine will not give as good immunity as natural infection. But of course, we don't know that because we don't have any long-term follow-up on the on the vaccine uh, uh, efficacy as of yet. Yeah, well, that's what I was alluding to. At least from the trials, the vaccine trials, it appears that the, the protection from reinfection is better with the vaccine than in the than in the placebo group. So it, it has that uh, has that look. And also, if you look carefully at the phase two immune response studies of the mRNA vaccines, you see that in both Moderna and in the BioNTech, at orders of magnitude higher neutralizing antibody, orders of magnitude higher than the typical convalescent person who has had COVID. So there are many indicators that the vaccine-induced immune response is superior to the natural infection. And as you say, it's unusual. And it's only been seen with one other virus, HPV, before. But that's the way it looks. And that's what our essay in, in Nature Medicine uh, points out. And in fact, more data has come out even since that was published last month to support that tenet. But, you know, I think to we all want to get out of this pandemic. <laughs> I mean, that's clear. Uh, and we want to be able to prevail. 
this would be a great step if we could do this, if we could capitalize on this very unfortunate broad spread that occurred in this country and, of course, in other parts of the world. I do agree with your point that we shouldn't look at COVID in isolation. We shouldn't look at the United States in isolation. The silly notion that we should have nationalism applied to our vaccination program when we're only going to get out of the woods when the predominant portion of the planet population, 70% or whatever percent, is vaccinated or protected. So we have to think more, much more broadly. I totally agree with you on those points. Yeah, I think with the vaccines, uh, we presume that uh, we know that the vaccine is very effective for uh, reducing symptoms, about 90 plus percent effective of that. So uh, that's very good and very promising. What we don't know, have data from yet is uh, if vaccines reduce mortality. We presume that it does because if it reduces symptoms, then we expect it will also reduce mortality. But we actually don't have data on that quite yet. Uh, also, we presume that if there's less symptoms, there will be less transmission, so that vaccine will prevent transmission also. But we don't have any, the way that the, the, the studies was designed, we don't have any uh, knowledge about that on the Pfizer vaccine either. So there are still a lot of uncertainties uh, in terms of how much benefit the vaccines will give. But uh, at this point, we know there will be some benefit and uh, uh, we need to use it uh, uh, because uh, it does it, it does provide protection. We don't know exactly how good the vaccine is at this point. It might be good. It might be great. We don't know. Uh, but uh, eventually we'll find those things out. I mean, the Moderna trial uh, is being published today in the New England Journal. It shows 30 severe infections uh, in the placebo group, zero severe infections in the um, treatment vaccine group. Also, in the Moderna trial, they did do nasopharyngeal swabs. They did look at asymptomatic infections. More work needs to be done on that. But so far, both that work and the AstraZeneca Oxford studies have suggested that transmission will be reduced, that it does reduce shedding, that it does have mucosal immunity, at least in a significant proportion of people. Whether that's complete, obviously, is not likely but at least it does look like there's going to be an effect of sterilization to some extent. But I, I think, you know, this has been a good discussion. I've, I'm, I'm glad to have the chance to meet you, Martin, and to hear your logic uh, about, you know, we have some differences. We agree to disagree. Um, and I, I know your intentions are, are good and solid, as are your colleagues. Uh, and I hope that this has been a good vetting of the issues and, you know, where we disagree and also where a lot more work needs to be done. Yeah, I think if one thing can come out of this discussion that uh, and, uh, uh, is if we can all push for better protection of the old, both through the vaccines and the other, other means, I think that is so very critically important uh, for public health. And for some reason has been forgotten. I think that's something we, we really, really have to push for much harder. And the other one is to get the schools and universities open. Uh, to me, that is, if we can get those two things, then that would be absolutely huge and absolutely fantastic. Um, and uh, it would be so important for the children and the young among us to be able to go to school in person. So if we can get those those things, then uh, I think we are, and with the two of us at agreement on that, if we can get more of a consensus among everybody on those things, then I think that will be huge and enormous benefit to society, uh, and especially among those less affluent and the working class who has really t taken the huge burden, and especially the, the, the working class in the inner cities, because uh, as with many infectious diseases, usually urban areas are harder hit than rural areas, because there's natural things. So uh, Therefore, there's been sort of a double whammy against the working class in the inner city because they are both urban and they are less affluent working class. So they are really taking a double whammy uh, on the on on the way that we that we have taken through this pandemic. Well, I think the I would say the conversation has come to a natural conclusion. So I would like to thank both of you. This is a model 
for uh, scholarly discussion. So my thanks to Professors Koldorf and Topol. I'll put links to both these gentlemen in the description of the video as well as on the show notes page. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Tom and Martin. Appreciate it. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Tom. I really appreciate it. And Happy New Year.